Good afternoon and welcome to this BCTLA webinar on Digital Literacy Training Program for Canadian Educators, focusing on media smarts, although we will be getting into some other um, digital literacy programs towards the end. First off, who is Media Smarts? Uh, well, Media Smarts is a Canadian uh, nonprofit centre for digital and media literacy. Um, they work with all um, uh, children and youth through their uh, platform to provide training for adults uh, to basically um, provide digital literacy uh, in schools. The people that most often use them are the teacher librarians like yourselves, but classroom teachers as are welcome to use this uh, program as well. So um, what we have to remember these days is that kids have grown up in a world where there is always technology. They don't know a time when technology really wasn't a part of their lives. And while we have to learn as we are going along as adults, they're learning as they're growing and it's almost a um, intuitive part of their learning at this point, both uh, from self-exploration, from their peers, and they are able to multitask within those, um, those apps. And as technology changes, it can be quite daunting to us as teachers, but less so to kids because everything's new. Um, and so we end up with sort of a conundrum because students are being asked to fit into a school environment where uh, digital and media uh, programs aren't as a large a part of their lives as they are outside of school. Um, there's a lot of questions still around whether or not it would be better to be a technolo uh, technology-less at school. But right now we have uh, systems where students are learned uh, outside of school using technology all the time and their parents aren't able to keep up either. At some point, someone has to teach the skills around this. And so it falls on us as uh, schools to deal with this and to actually look at how we can uh, teach kids proper um, technology skills. You may have heard the term digital natives, where the idea is that kids are born into um, a technology to the point where it's just second nature to them. But though they know how to use technology, that doesn't mean they have the critical skills to decide whether or not the use they are getting is wise, effective, or if they're using it in a way that's going to better our world or if they're going to use it in ways that uh, might cause problems for themselves or others, which is another way of saying we need digital media literacy skills. And so what is media literacy? Well, it's the ability to uh, access, analyze, evaluate and produce media and by doing so, become active rather than passive consumers of media. Um, it's about helping students uh, understand what their role in media is. And so there's uh, five key concepts. That media is a construction. Media has commercial implications. Audiences negotiate meaning. Each medium has a unique aesthetic form and media has social and political implications. And we're actually going to delve into some of these uh, because these concepts of media literacy, uh, while they may uh, apply to traditional media such as video, also apply just as much to the digital world that we live in. So we're going to look at both this and digital media uh, uh, as one sort of overarching idea. Media used to be straightforward. People produced things like magazines, newspapers, radio, and television, then distributed it to the masses. You were the last link in the chain. 
Today we have the internet. Not a chain, but a network of digital connections. With no beginning and no end. But there's one thing about media that hasn't changed over the years. Media are constructions. Media are created largely for social, political, or commercial purposes. To sell products or services, values or ideals to you, your family, and your friends. Our digitally connected world is constantly transforming the way we play, learn, and interact with each other. Digital media are getting more sophisticated and harder to navigate. To survive and thrive in a networked digital age, you need to know and understand how to access digital media, analyze it, evaluate it, and produce it. Be aware and be smart. Digital Media Smart. Think of the different digital media you use. Identify who made them, how they work, and how they make money for their creators. So, on top of all of the things to do with media literacy, we add in our third uh, dimension to it. That is, digital media literacy is networked. It is um, a thing that is interconnected in such a way that it is impossible to say that you're one-on-one -on -one at any given time, even if you uh, think you are. Digital media can have unexpected audiences because often digital media can be shared after the fact. And it persists uh, on servers. And once it's out on the internet, it can be shared and reshared and can go much further than you expect. Interactions through digital media can have a real impact. And digital media experiences are shaped by the tools we use. So let's have a look at some sample activities to uh, talk about that. So this is our first key concept. The digital media is networked. And we're going to have a look into this with this next activity. So this is a video that shows a quick look at this concept that you could actually use to uh, introduce it to your students. Traditional media like radio, television, and print are largely one way, meaning you can't really do anything but listen, watch, or read it. In today's ultra-networked world, digital media are interconnected and interactive. Online, you're part of an infinite network. You can connect to others as easily as they can connect to you. You can find communities of users with common interests, values, and beliefs. You have instant access to people, information, and knowledge from around the world. The flip side? Anyone can post anything online and make it look authentic. So you have to double check information you find to make sure it's for real. Be aware and be smart. Digital Media Smart. Think of the last time you learned something or saw a news story online. How did you know if it was true? What steps did you take to find out? So let's have a look at a sample activity that goes with this idea that digital media are networked. Um, the first thing is that this connectivity means, as was in the video, the barrier to participate in our digitally networked world is far less than it used to be. It used to be you had to be sort of someone almost to um, uh, participate in the conversation of creation. You had to be, uh, have money behind you. You had to have influence in order to get your message out there. But now anyone can publish content and find an audience. Digital media lets users interact with their peers, celebrities, random strangers, all at the same time, which has some really important implications when we need to authenticate information, recognize the source's bias, point of view, if we're being marketed to, if we can trust the person on the other end. 
And so uh, for each of these activities, we're going to uh, look at both how it connects to the curriculum, but also how you can get more general information on how digital literacy fits in. Uh, and there is a classroom guide available from Media Smarts that you can use for that. So here's four things. The peacock spider, the tree octopus, the blobfish, and the cyclops shark. Which are real and which are not? You might have some familiarity with this already. And one of the challenges in teaching our students to be skeptical is that the world is full of strange things. Um, and we can't always rely on our instincts to know what is real and what's not. Uh, you may already know this, being in BC, uh, which of these is not real. That would be the Pacific tree octopus. Um, but um, if you've never encountered the Pacific tree octopus before, well, you might be taken in by their website that uh, purports it to be an endangered species. And so this website has fooled many people over the years uh, because it looks fairly believable. And sometimes that's a silly kind of thing, like this one, but sometimes it's more nefarious. So this has long been one of the uh, first Google search pieces around Martin Luther that came up. And on the face of it, it looks fine until you start to delve in more. And there might be some clues. Um, as to what's going on in here, and that uh, this might not be a legitimate source, but you probably won't be able to get directly from it that this is actually a fake website run by a white supremacist group that's using this to spread false information about Martin Luther King. Now, over time, the number of complaints has uh, caused this to be delisted from many um, uh, search engines, but the uh, fact that it sat there so highly for so long uh, really uh, is a huge problem. And so let's take these uh, three ones. And if we were doing this as a class, you divide it up into a to F is going to go to Fact Monster, G to M is going to go to Simple Wikipedia, and N to Z is going to go to All About Explorers. And they're all going to look for Jacques Cartier. And um, uh, try and figure out what, uh, which source is best, which is most complete, which is most relevant, which is most accurate. And, well... If we were to have done this and talk about it as a class, for the Fact Monster group, it is relevant, it's accurate, it's not very complete, it's an American source, uh, so uh, it sort of brings that piece in that it's not a Canadian source. It's got a lot of advertising, uh, which is pretty common in a um, free service aimed at kids because you're not paying for it, then you are yourself the product. Uh, simple Wikipedia. Um, it's about as relevant and complete as a uh, fact monster. It doesn't have the ads. Um, it doesn't look as easy to read. Um, and an older student uh, might get more out of trying to read regular Wikipedia, but um, it's, how do we know if it's reliable? Well, the last changed in 2017, hasn't been edited recently, um, which is generally a good sign on Wikipedia that it's not being uh, changed a lot. And um, uh, people aren't arguing over what should be included or, or more. And Wikipedia does allow you to look at the history of the page to see what's happened and like how it's changed over time. What about all explorers? And this one looks fine on the surface. 
But it isn't. This is a a lot of the information here is completely made up. It is made up on purpose by a teacher who wanted uh, students to learn that they can't trust everything they read online. And you probably would figure this out quicker than a student would, that some of this isn't true. Um, the For others, though, this might not work as well. Like a, a student probably doesn't have the critical skills to have noticed that this is a little off. Um, and it does have a lot of information, though. Uh, and so some students might just take this as their only source and not look around and double check against it. And then we get into all sorts of problems because when sources look more complete, sometimes we neglect to double check them. So it's really important that we provide students with reliable sources, that we get them prepared to do effective research online by teaching them effective search skills figuring out how to use things properly, how to use Wikipedia for meta searching and lateral searching. So we look up websites rather than looking up information. By looking up all about explorers on uh, Wikipedia, what do we find? How do we go to fact checking resources to find out if something is real or not? So that's our first sort of lesson and key concept. Second is digital media is shareable and persistent. And so this is the idea that once it's out there, it's kind of permanent, that getting rid of every copy of a digital record is really difficult because it gets copied, shared, spread so quickly and indexed by so many different things. And lots of things take snapshots as well that uh, cause it to... Um, uh, stick around even on things like a way back machine. So um, those kind of versioning history sites can also cause uh, things to be harder to get rid of. Digital media are shareable and persistent. Thanks to the internet, people like you and me can publish work to wider audiences than ever before. We can share digital experiences with friends across the city or around the world, anytime we want. But it's also important to remember that your online activities leave digital footprints, even when you don't think they do. Videos, music, words and pictures that you post or share online are stored somewhere on the network, perhaps even multiple locations. Each can be searched and indexed, copied, manipulated, transmitted, then stored again somewhere else. This includes digital media that you think are temporary. Every interaction is converted to data, aggregated, and can be analyzed by others. Be aware and be smart. Digital Media Smart. Think of the data you generate each time you use a social network or search engine, or play an online game. Who is collecting that data, and why? So this is personally one of my favorite activities, putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, it's one I like going to because it's got a creative piece to it, but it's also got um, a lot of really good content to it. So it starts off with us um, creating a um, little mini stop motion and the video is not going to play but it shows a um person finding a toothpaste tube jumping on it so it squeezes out and then trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube and finding he can't and the point of this is to uh teach students about online data and there's how you use it and how online data can be very difficult to withdraw once it's out there. And so we talk about the principles of animation to create a quick stop motion. Uh, we do it on PowerPoint. Um, 
uh, using duplicates of slides and moving things slowly across um, so that we can uh, create our stop motion animation in PowerPoint. And we storyboard it out and do lots of different things. So here's a um, example of a storyboard, hide and seek. An actor downstage covering their eyes, four others stand upstage, then they move away, they look left, look right, the actor holds out the phone and a phone appears, a hand and a phone appears in it. The other actors appear in the original location. Um, when I've done uh, this with students, they've done all sorts of different ideas. Uh, one student uh, who was really interested in physics, and despite being a grade six student, um, uh, realized that the nature of information on the internet is very much like entropy and uh, did up a whole presentation about that. Others uh, focused on like say what would happen if you say a mean comment and can't take it back, uh, real life and um, uh, online content. Others around you don't know who's going to be watching uh, when you do something, who might be recording, who might uh, put it online and you can't get it back, all those kind of things. And so uh, this is a really neat sort of um, uh, one, and it's very easy to do in uh, something like PowerPoint because you've got lots of tools to be able to do it built in, and it doesn't take a lot of time or resources. And students are quite familiar with sort of drawing stick figures um, that uh, it's quite simple for them to get their head around how they might do it. So uh, the next concept we're going to look at is digital media has unexpected audiences. And so this sort of links into those uh, previous two that we don't always know who's on the other side of the computer when we send something. Um, that both the idea that our content might go further than we think, but also that we don't know necessarily that we're communicating with who we think we are. And so we're going to watch this video and then look at the sample lesson. <laughs> Because digital media is so easy to create and publish, it's tough to control who sees your content and who doesn't. Let's say you create a simple website to celebrate your favorite pet, but plan to share it only with your class. If one of your classmates shares a link or a search engine webbot indexes your site, those funny pictures will get a much wider distribution than you expect. You should also know that anything once published is virtually impossible to erase. Just because you click delete doesn't mean it's gone. Chances are multiple copies will have already circulated across the internet, already viewed by audiences you don't even know. Be aware and be smart. Digital Media Smart. When you share things online with friends, who else... So, sorry, I knocked it there. I'm saying uh, when you share things online with friends, uh, who else might see it? And so this is a really important concept to introduce quite young. Uh, so this one utilizes uh, iconography and um, a pictorial sort of a way of doing things to try and help uh, you use this with younger audiences because it's one of the key concepts for getting kids to stay safe online. So um, doing an activity like this uh, with a group that's younger, you also need to think about your breaking, breaking it down into steps, but also that um, uh, as well as that chunking that you're giving adequate sort of lead time and um, changing things up uh, quite a bit. And because we don't, I uh, can't guarantee any students got reading and writing skills around um, this age. Um, we need to think about alternate ways to do it. So the first is a discussion about time capsules and what we know already and what we want to know. And then watching a video and uh, recording what we learn through uh, pictures. And so we want to get across this idea that time capsule 
is something that we're going to put somewhere safe so that people can see what things are like in the future long after we're gone. And so we can, as a group, create our time capsule by um, cutting things out of magazines or uh, newspapers or pictures or whatever uh, you find that you want to do and help them represent their lives today and things that matter to them. But the next piece is to then go, okay, well, what would an internet time capsule look like? Unlike a time capsule that's going to be buried somewhere, an internet time capsule isn't sealed. Things you do might come back in 40 years, five minutes. It can be accessed by anyone, by people you know, by people you don't know. But whatever you do can be seen by someone. And so you can get them to think about, like, would you want your most embarrassing memories online? Would you want something silly you did as a toddler to uh, uh, be put online? These kind of things could easily become a big deal later on. And so we need to think about how we approach these things. So the next uh, concept is that interaction through digital media can have a real impact. Um, the idea that even uh, if we're not the creator, by the act of viewing in a digital sphere, we're not passive viewers in the same way um, that we are when we're watching a program on TV, where there's no interaction back and forth. Comment sections, um, the ability to share and other things make things more interactive than traditional media. And on top of this, as we're interacting, we are missing the cues that allow us to know how someone is actually feeling about things. So this next section is really about ethics and empathy, and we're going to delve into that. <laughs> Because digital media are so interactive, they can affect our behavior, perceptions, beliefs, and our feelings about the world around us. Even though it may not seem like it, our interactions through digital media can have a real impact on others. For instance, that funny photo you post or joking text you send may not be so funny to those viewing it. It can be hard to know how something you've said or done online makes other people feel. That's because facial expression, tone of voice, and other valuable cues are completely missing from the experience. Also, because people sometimes feel anonymous when they're using digital media, they may act differently. They might post things they normally wouldn't, or say things they shouldn't. They may forget that laws, morals, and rights apply online too. And sometimes, the words or outspoken opinions of just a few people can seem to represent everybody. The positive side of this notion is that we can all be full citizens online, even kids. We can get involved in our communities, connect with experts and mentors, and contribute personally to making the world a better place. Be aware and be smart. Digital Media Smart. Think about a time when something online was misunderstood, either by you or someone else. How can we avoid unintentionally hurting people's feelings? So what we're going to look at is something called an ethics, uh, sorry, an empathy trap, um, which is this concept that um, by being on the other side of a screen, and not being able to see the other person, that anonymity creates this um, this feeling that we aren't um, as accountable for our actions as we would be if we were face to face. And we often are able to forget that what we do online can have real consequences. 
So we're going to have a look at some short videos with this activity. So the first thing you would do is say, Amelia is not very happy. Uh, uh, sorry, Jody is not very happy with this picture Amelia's posted. Why do you think that is? And see what people come up with. Uh, they might be able to uh, figure out what's going on here. They might have some other ideas. Uh So we can see from this video that um, the friends are sort of piling on Jody uh, for this photo, Br uh, bring it back to a time that she wants to forget, which is when she had braces and was teased about it. Um, and so part of the interactivity of social media is that bystanding piece that we can have in uh, in person bullying, it also exists within cyber bullying. That by other people not standing up for you, not commenting, not uh, showing empathy, and not wading into it, the um, it feels like you're on your own. And so, empathy traps. Um, really come down to a few different things first off remembering that everyone involved is a real person um and the you have to sort of imagine that what would you actually say if they were sitting right next to you not responding right away even if it's got a upset or angry or afraid and think about talking it out in person so that you can actually talk about how you're feeling and show it, uh, rather than letting the online drama blow up. And talking to your friends and family about how you feel. Um, kids have consistently said that having someone listen to them is the most effective way of dealing with online conflict. And if you can't talk to someone you know, there's all sorts of helplines that exist, like Kids Help Phone, uh, that can allow you to uh, get uh help if you need it and keeping an idea on how you're feeling it's hard to make good decisions when you're mad scared or embarrassed if your heart is racing uh, and you're feeling tense it's time to get offline for a while and so this doesn't just apply to the people making the mean comments but also those receiving them as well that perhaps they don't uh, understand how it's making you feel and stuff like that. And so rather than lashing out in anger, uh, it's better to uh, try and find that time to talk it out in person and uh, discuss things properly. But what uh, Media Smarts has found is that uh, young people really do value their privacy online especially when it comes to other people sharing their photos, but they're more likely to wait if they've posted a photo to wait for someone to ask them to take it down instead of asking the person in the picture initially for permission. And this doesn't just apply to kids. Uh, a lot of adults do this as well, just assuming it's okay until I've been told it's not. We've all heard that saying it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. Um, and so it's really important to think about these things. And another area that um, uh, it's important to encourage empathy is cyberbullying. Um, when kids witness it, uh, kids who say they've been cyberbullied uh, say that uh, people who see it, uh, sorry, that made no sense of the sentence. Kids who've been cyberbullied say that what people who see it uh, do can have a big impact as the bully's actions, that bystanding piece I just talked about. Of course, helping kids avoid 
the empathy traps is also a good way of keeping them from doing mean things online. So we have all of these uh, disparate pieces, not disparate, but like connect interconnected people pieces, the cyber bully, the cyber bullied, and the bystanders, just like in real life. But we often don't realize just how difficult it is to get away online. And kids often don't realize how much of a difference it makes when you can't escape. <laughs> So a lot of what's happening in the world with online media these days is sort of that um, you got me, I'll get you feeling that people feel that some instigating situation has happened that means they now have a right to be mean back. And it, what it does is uh, just compounds uh, the problems. And so Jody here is going to make the problem worse by trying to get back at Aaron for posting an embarrassing photo, uh, or for being mean to Khalil by posting an embarrassing photo. And as the person receiving these texts, if you, uh, you go through it with kids, like, how would you actually deal with this? What could you uh do if you were witnessing this what could you do if you were jody in the situation or khalil like how would you actually deal with this and talking about that empathy and trying to get students to understand the two wrongs here do not make a right and that um this is how situations compound into something much bigger the next concept is that digital media experiences are shaped by the tools we use, that they reflect our biases, beliefs, and unquestioned assumptions from their creators. Uh, and because they're networked and interactive, they don't just affect the meaning and message of digital media, but our own experiences and how we behave too. Um, a lot of the conversation around X these days is about how Elon Musk, since he became the owner, has radically altered how the app behaves from taking away the ability to know whether or not the person was is a legitimate source from verification to rolling back uh, protections on um, things like doxing um, and even getting rid of their um, fact-checking uh, pieces. And all of these compound to create a very different tool to the original one that a lot of people were using for a while. And that is definitely something that we're seeing in real time right now. But students don't always know that because they're coming from things with a much more limited um, knowledge of um, how things used to be. So if they logged on to X for the first time now, they would never know what it used to be and what, how the tools used to work what they would see is just as it is right now and assume that that's how it's meant to be used. Digital media takes on many forms, but the way it's presented mirrors the biases and beliefs of its creators. Whether you're playing an online game, browsing a technology forum, or surfing a social media app. Your experiences are affected by conscious and unconscious decisions of a designer or programmer. Digital media creators spend a great deal of time creating memorable experiences for visitors. From fonts and colors to sophisticated algorithms that offer up curated, personalized content. Navigation through these digital places is usually carefully choreographed and can even affect how you interact with other people. 
Social networks, for example, are specifically designed to encourage sharing and posting of comments, news stories, videos, and photos. Media creators can have a lot of influence over your online experience. It's important to understand how the structure of digital media can be used to affect your journey. Be aware and be smart. Digital Media Smart. Think of a favorite website or app. What is it about the design that makes you come back to it? So, the next activity we're going to look at is around avatars and body image. Um, grade four to six is sort of where most students start interacting with websites and video games that may involve avatars of some kind, uh, some digital representation of you. And if you've been a lot around in the, uh, on the internet or uh, played a lot of video games, you might be familiar with how body image can be affected here. Um, avatars are a curious thing because they take a lot of bias from the creators of the software. And so as we look at these three different avatars, we see the our cutesy little uh, monster, um, a Minecraft uh, guy, and a very uh, scantily clad warrior from World of Warcraft. And the fact that so often women are portrayed through avatars as um, needing to be in small amounts of clothes, showing off their bodies and stuff like that, is very much a intentional piece of the creators, just as male uh, avatars often have muscular uh, features and uh, are showing off a different hypersexualized form. And so this uh, avatar maker is all about uh, getting students to think about these kind of things um, and try and understand what it is that we experience when we're creating avatars. And many game makers these days are very conscious of this and trying to move away from sort of the stereotypes and the traditional um, um uh pieces but uh we often still have uh games out there and websites that are pushing that very particular view of the uh traditional male and female forms so hopefully these activities have uh helped show you how we get these key concepts across to kids at different ages um, and giving you a good idea of how you can create a digital uh, literacy curriculum for yourself uh, using these, um, these different lessons in the order that you want to teach them in, bring in things in timely manners. You don't need to uh, focus on everything all the time, but choosing things that you feel would be most important at the time that you're doing them. Um, Media Smarts is free to use. All of the resources are freely available. Um, and we talked a lot about some of the negative pieces around uh, digital media, but there's also some amazing opportunities um, that are present. For instance, the fact that digital media is network means it's Access to information is easier than ever. And digital technology has the potential to connect us all around the world. Similarly, shareable uh, media allows us to publish to a wide audience and collaborate inside and outside of the classroom. Um, as an adult creator uh, working on a um, new uh, document uh, for Canadian school libraries, I was able to uh, work with people all across Canada 
simultaneously collaborating on a single document inside a cloud program. And that allows us to work together outside of our traditional areas so that I don't have to just work with someone I can sit next to, but work with people from anywhere. And digital media means that students, no matter their age, can be uh, digital citizens and can contribute to online communities. And students can access expert advice, mentorship, and feedback from all across the world. And so we're going to skip over that one for a second, but uh, and come to this idea that there's other things out there. If you're not familiar with Social Media by Jennifer Casa Todd, she's a um, teacher um, out of Ontario uh, who has a brilliant uh, digital literacy um, way of doing things by using social media to lead change in a very participatory manner, leveraging what kids are doing online anyway into a leadership opportunity. Uh, civics allows, um, uh, focuses a lot on information literacy and lateral thinking. Um, it's control F resource is fantastic for helping kids to understand how to use meta searching techniques such as lateral thinking and lateral searching to move across um, information, looking up sources rather than just looking in sources. And Common Sense Media has its own really good um, uh, digital media literacy program, but it is American and not available in French. Uh, its second language is Spanish that um, a lot of its um, things have been translated into. Um, so outside of media smarts, there are other options as well. So hopefully um, this has been useful and uh, you'll be able to use some of this in your classroom. Thank you very much for listening and um, um, a wetsa. Mm -hmm.